третью сессию. So that is entitled the choice choice of modern russia stability or development how can they be combined well i see that the very title of our meeting implies a question so development against stability are they compatible and if uh, yes, how? Especially if uh, we remember our past, the past of our country, uh, we can uh, see that the events, uh, what happened in 1917, uh, was prepared back in the days of the Russian Empire, and the First World War was uh, just a trigger that uh, brought about the changes that were prepared in the previous decades and even centuries and there is this idea out there at the same time uh, we had a period of stability in the soviet period in the 1970s and this in turn had destructive consequences for the country so how can we mix uh, stability and development? Uh, this is the question for this roundtable, for this panel discussion that I'm asking. So uh, how can we combine stability and development? And I would like to ask Mr. Buchtev, uh, our guest from Donetsk, from the Donetsk People's University, and who organizes Zinoviev readings in uh, Ukraine. So, what is uh, the time limit? Uh, Ten minutes. So I would like uh, to begin with some definitions and define stability and uh, development uh, since uh, what we have in this title is a huge mix. We have to understand the difference uh, between notions and representations. Uh, concept, the concept of time, of space, of structure and so on. And it usually uh, this leads us to the objective truth, as Mr. Zinoviev uh, said on a number of occasions. And the second thing uh, is uh, what we think about certain, certain objects, about the conference, about this glass, and so on. So our representations is 10 to 15 percent objective, and all the rest is uh, subjective. And as of uh, today, we are mostly guided by our perceptions, by subjective uh, perceptions, and uh, they can be placed in any wording, in any narrative that uh, is not re re related to reality. And what is the result? What uh, this leads to is a misunderstanding or a distorted perception of anything, war, peace, friendship, anything. And as of today, we are in this subjective world, uh, in this world of representations. Uh, And uh, why? Why does this happen? There are social reasons uh, everywhere. Humans want to dominate, and they want their perspective, their personal views, uh, to dominate. We had this notion of sustainable development. Uh, and uh, there is a contradiction between the notion of sustainability and of development. And those who had children, th where there is development, there is no sustainability. There is uh, 
you know, development requires attention, for example, attention to a child. If there is stability, you start to worry whether is everything is fine with the child, with the baby, why is there, there is not enough activity. So uh, there is always this contradiction between sustainability and development. So when we want to analyze something, for example, this subject that we're discussing, stability and development in today's Russia, we have to start with the comprehensive approach of the subject that we're discussing, no matter in what language, in Russian, in English, in Italian, in German, or in Ukrainian. As an example, I wanted to to give you an example of misunderstanding, this is a tragic example. You've heard uh, about Donbass, uh, and uh, I would like to tell you about the developments in the Donetsk People's Republic, its establishment. Uh, we have, uh, what we have is an image. I see images that we get from the media, from Ukrainian media, from Russian media. We see that there is uh, an ideological um, struggle between the two countries, but they're often inconsistent with the reality on the ground. The reality is much harsher. And when you hear uh, shells exploding nearby is one thing and when you read about it in the media is another thing so it is not uncommon for us uh, to have only an image about certain things that we're discussing and the latest uh, developments uh, they uh, show that stability and development are development and sustainability are inconsistent. We have 2 million people who live in the region and 700,000 people are retirees. They have reached the retirement age. People believed, they trusted, they understood. They, call, they refer to Zaharchenko as the father and when everything fell out of nowhere, we had this wonderful autumn in Donetsk in the center. When this happened, it was a life-changing situation. Now the Donetsk People's Republic is in a crisis, in a political crisis, and uh, politics is at the foundation of everything in the country. Our government is authoritarian. There is uh, a specific team, and November 11 uh, will be the date of elections in our uh, Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, opinions may vary on these developments, but uh, I wanted to end my remarks with the following statement. When we start uh, taking, uh, thinking about development, we have to have this comprehensive approach, taking into consideration all the dimensions uh, to understand the right position in order to be able to take appropriate decisions, then, then uh, to make sure that the decisions that we take are ra rational, that they not only take into consideration tactical aspects, but also strategic uh, uh, features. So tactics lead nowhere. We also need a strategy. What is more important, uh, the essence of the matter or just the image? What is the strategic direction in which we're heading? We can argue about this or that. Since the question when we ask how and what, what and why, can 
we explain this because then then this is a question of um, confidence in the government uh, and there is no such understanding at this moment because we have a lot of uh, lag in terms of start taking up these uh, problems we organized uh, a bureau of the Zinoviev uh, society and uh, we tried uh, to conduct a demographic analysis of the Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, no, how do you think, was anyone interested in this uh, initiative? Uh, no one was interested. Yes, I'm ending here. In order to preserve the stability, we have to understand. And if we do not understand, how can we ensure stability? So this idea, when the goals uh, uh, are set, we have to have a comprehensive approach. So without this forward-looking thinking, there will be no stability, and all is left is development. And uh, the leaders have to be mindful of, of both stability and develop. So this is uh, a question of whether your decisions are ra rational in terms of tactics and strategy. Uh, thank you so much. I see uh, that uh, stability and development are incompatible. Well, Mr. Baburin probably does not agree. You will have your 10 minutes uh, to express your opinion. Mr. Baburin, uh, President of the International Slavic Academy of Art and Culture. So, uh, thank you very much, distinguished participants uh, in this uh, panel discussion. I will begin uh, by stating my disagreement with the previous speaker and uh, I will then go on to a point in, on which we do agree. Yes, uh, I believe that stability and development are compatible and when this is the case, uh, the society can develop itself. In fact, uh, sustainable development is a very good term. What it tells us is that we need to develop ourselves in harmony when, uh, with harmony between people and the environment. In terms of politics, uh, a newborn has a temperature of 36.6 uh, uh, and has normal blood pressure and th throughout this life uh, these metrics remain the same. But while the human changes, uh, stability doesn't, is not about stopping. It is about uh, different things. When we're speaking about the choice for modern Russia, what I want to agree with uh, Mr. Bukhtev is the following. Uh, this question has been raised in many countries and uh, it has been discussed within Russia and beyond. Where are we headed? What do we want? What do we do to develop our society? What uh, is the goal for today's Russia? Early 20th century was about our grandfathers and grand-grandfather were building a future. They sacrificed their lives and their health to build this society. And the entire humanity looked at uh, Soviet Russia as it developed. Maybe not everyone will agree. I think that the 1961 program for the Communist Party was uh, a big uh, problem that paved the way to all the problems that stated the goal of building the co communist regime by 1980. 
And the problem was not that when 1980 came about, there was no uh, communism in sight. Uh, the problem is that there was no new objective that was articulated for the society, and this has been going on for 30 years now. And in this uh, respect, I totally agree with Mr. Buchtev until we have a purpose, a strategic objective that would be elaborated not by experts, not by researchers, by, but by politicians, by top government officials. People will not come together around these politicians uh, and promote uh, stable development. Um, several days ago, I spoke at the Donetsk National University. I'm a professor there, and I have um, classes there. Sometimes I'm present there in person. Sometimes I teach via video conference. And everyone will tell you who heard my lectures that there is no answer what Russia wants from them. The Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic are not recognized as independent states. They were not accepted into the Russian Federation. And the third option is to return to Ukraine. And in this, uh, on this question, we, the representatives of Russia, will do everything to end this madness, uh, but the, we need political will. So when we speak about um, the choice for today's Russia, let's look objectively and uh, uh, understand that the Russian world in the Russian Federation is uh, still asleep. We expect someone to come around and solve all the problems. The only place when there is something happening, when there is this civilizational struggle is going on, is uh, the Transnistria and the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics, because for them this is a question of survival. And we are just waiting. Um, and it is up to all of us to shape the public opinion, but we are not the ones who take the political decisions. But I do believe that we have to make a choice. It is high time that we recognize Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. It is high time that we bring clarity to the table, even though, even if it's challenging, if it is not easy. But how can it become worse compared to what we have today that when someone does not want to recognize uh, the reunification with Crimea and Sevastopol. I spoke in Germany recently, but and not, not everyone liked it, but from the podium I said that Sevastopol and Crimea came back to Russia. They were illegally outside of the Russian Federation since 1954. If someone does not like it, you can discuss this for 10,000 years, but it will not be different. It will not change anything. And then this... Um, respect. I think that we have to give up on neoliberal illusions and we have to start glorifying neoliberal economic approaches when, when we're being told to focus on rights and freedoms. And but we have to understand that there are other values like uh, faith and saints, uh, the motherland, uh, but we do not have even the value of labor. In the past, labor was uh, the main feature of social identity for any person, but people are now free to decide whether they will uh, work to the benefit of the society or not, and it is up, not up to the society to interfere. So this uh, consumerist madness in our constitution makes development impossible in today's situation. They want to keep us at the level of a colonial, colonized country. Only constitutional reform will help we have to take out of it all the nihilistic uh, provisions. So only mobilization 
by modernizing our economy and our economists, Russian economists, have been speaking about this for a very long time. Only this way can we preserve the Russian civilization for which morality and spirituality have primary importance. Yes, of course, there are always people who think more about the bank accounts abroad, but, and, but even if they speak Russian, they are no longer Russian, because if you are Russian, you belong to a certain civilization and share certain values. Can I ask a question? So, a question. Why there is no clarity on the following issue? For five years, people uh, have been living in uh, Donetsk in a very distressed situation. They've been living this way for 13, for five years, and 13,000 people died. So why a decision has not been taken? This uncertainty is now, uh, there is a stable state of uncertainty. This is a question, well, not exactly for me. I can say that there is no political will and no political decision. And uh, if you ask me why there is no political will, this uh, does not uh, depend uh, entirely on the president of the Russian Federation, but also on his team. There are many people who have accounts, bank accounts abroad. There are uh, many people who are afraid of losing something. When the president gets rid of all these people, we will be able to change this situation. Well, uh, Mr. Baburin, let me just say that you know the, what decision is, will be the right one. And uh, you already know the decision and this is what you proceed from. So you have this, uh, this idea that it would be right to protect people who are fighting for the Russian world in Donetsk. So let's move on. We will have a discussion later. So, colleagues, uh, please uh, let us uh, keep some order. Madam Zinovieva, so whom do you support? Mr. Mironov, who had a just Russia party, wanted to attend this uh, third uh, panel because this is not just uh, about the Communist Party, who were also unable to be represented. And uh, Mr. Baburin was able to come. I have uh, nothing to say against those who did not come, but they lost an opportunity to be at the same table and to discuss topics uh, that are so relevant for everyone. Mr. Mironov uh, sent uh, his greetings to our conference. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, uh, more of uh, a uh, statement of his ideas. He, he, the message is pretty short. So uh, to the participants in the Zinoviev readings, uh, a very good afternoon, colleagues and friends. I am glad and delighted to greet all the participants in the Zinoviev readings. And I would like to thank its organizers for choosing the subject post-Sovietism and post-capitalism by Alexander Zinoviev's which kind of social and political system do I want to create? It is hard to come up with a more topical question. The world is uh, undergoing transformation that touch uh, all aspects of the society, social, political, economic, cultural. We are entering a new era that will require us to use new approaches. So all countries are asking questions. Where is the world headed? How will the post-industrial society develop? How can we ensure a just and fair society in a digital economy? 
And uh, these questions are especially urgent for Russia, our home country. Our country embarked on a process called by Zinoviev as catastrophic. This happened about 30 years ago. There are many models, political models across the world. They are all different, but um, many of them refer to a social state. Russia historically um, wanted a just and fair state. And this is how they understood the notion of the social state. And. Uh, we can see that the liberal values are not entrenched in Russia. Russian citizens still believe the state to be the fundamental institution for protecting their interests, and the society expect the authorities to uh, govern in a just and fair manner. It is essential that we have a clear criteria for building a social state that we follow in our work. Some may think that all these matters are simply about research and academic discussion, but they are relevant in today's world and are vital for anyone in Russia. The recent tragedy in a, a college in Kerch is a case in point. Research by the Sociology Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences shows that in almost all Russian regions and across all generations, there is more and more aggressivity, more and more people want to just go on a shooting rampage. And the leading psychiatrist of the country explained this aggressive sentiment by the crisis of morality and the lack of the feeling of justice and fairness. This process is uh, obviously going on across the world and they call on politicians uh, to draw the relevant conclusions. And going back to the topic of this discussion, we have to say that the our party has been searching for these answers for quite a while. And I'm happy that we're working closely with the Zinoviev Club and we're mindful of what Alexander Zinoviev said that um, the wonderful ideals can bring about some negative consequences. There is uh, nothing to do about it. Uh, there is always a plus and a minus, uh, and all the uh, Marxist uh, writers could not foresee that humanity will, ha will, will have to go through hell before getting to heaven. Alexander Zinoviev understood very well the social processes, and by understanding them in our turn, we will be able to take better political and social decisions and avoid many mistakes. I do hope that this conference will be an important step towards finding answers uh, to questions of what social system is required for Russia to thrive and what we need to do. And I wish you every success in your work. Sergei Mironov, uh, thank you to Mr. Mironov and thank you, Madam Zinovieva. I would like to give the floor to Elvira. I have not represent you uh, an observer and a s member of the Zinoviev Club. I wanted to start uh, not uh, with an introduction, but just um, with a quote. Uh, about uh, one month ago, I was at a major conference on globalism and global capitalism in London. and. Uh, in some very strange way, I uh, saw Zinoviev's ideas in uh, circles uh, that are very far from philosophy or from philosophical theory. So this happened uh, during a presentation by a um, Scottish woman. She said there was a Russian philosopher said uh, a very interesting word, and uh, she said in uh, Russia, she was speaking in English, but she said, Chelovenik, human hill. 
I said, she said, probably it was Bakunin. So this is why I came, uh, went to her after her presentation and I told her that this was Zinoviev and not Bakunin. Yes, yes, of course. So I showed her the list of his works and we are now um, writing letters to each other. So this is just to begin my presentation. As for my remarks, I wanted to go back to the question, what kind of uh, political system do we want for Russia in order to answer this question? We probably have to understand what kind of resources we have, our strategic resources. In terms of strategical resources, in terms of our choice, we have we are very limited. I have only four ways that I see four possible strategies. The first one is to develop what we developed in the 1990s, develop political economic relations with the West and as uh, Zinoviev said, to look to the West. Uh, and uh, this uh, way we will be always behind the West and we will be always calculating uh, how far are we behind the West, how many years, how many centuries. And the West uh, is uh, not just uh, a, um, a set of uh, very different countries, but an ideal image that we have created for ourselves. And since this is an ideal, we will always be behind. We will never be able to catch up with this ideal because you, you, you can never find something ideal in real life unless uh, the um, program of the Communist Party for 61, of course. I do not think that I have uh, to explain why this strategy has no future. The second option was also mentioned today and is often mentioned uh, at uh, many events on this matter. This has uh, to do with finding your own unique path, building on your own strategy, uh, tra traditions, on your own history. And uh, the question is, uh, what kind of history should we use as a foundation? The Orthodox uh, uh, Russia, the Soviet Union, this is our history as well, the Russian Empire. These are very different um, states with different values, with different uh, representations of how they live, with different economic uh, models and different politics. Uh, So uh, uh, our past is very diverse, so it is hard to use it as an inspiration for the future. I think we can hardly use this strategy. The third option, it is also frequently mentioned uh, uh, to uh, find inspiration in the Eastern Tigers, uh, China, Singapore, South Korea, their expansionist policy, and there were ideas of this kind. I do not know. I think um, that um, th this is a different mentality, a different culture, so it's unlikely to move with this way. China started to looking at the domestic market only in 2008 before that, they did not think about how they live themselves. So we can hardly expect our people to work as uh, Chinese people. And another option is uh, to take something from the West, uh, from uh, China, uh, also adopt uh, very high standards for ourselves as we always do in Russia and to work um, just one of the characters from Google who combined everything maybe in theory uh, this could be attractive but this has never um, been the case in history so far well, I do not see any other strategies, possible strategies, that we could choose. 
and I came to the conclusion I had no other option than to find a fifth strategy. We have to focus on our internal problems. And I, for myself, I, and I, this is what I do in my work, I, I also work in small cities in the rural areas, I work with ordinary people. I think that one of our m main challenges is the deteriorating quality of the population and the deteriorating quality of the political elite. And it is, but it is very hard to interact, communicate with the political elite because the political elite thinks that they are already perfect and that they do not need any improvements in any way. The second point is to improve and to develop the intellectual elite. Uh, the, uh, the intellectual elite is not uniform. Uh, But there is no intellectual or moral uniformity in the elite. And I think that we, uh, the Zinoviev Club, what we can do is to contribute to making it more uniform and bringing this elite together. And maybe uh, this will improve the intellectual capability of our country because both the intellectual, intellectual capability and the moral capability of our population is... Uh, Uh, very complicated. What I liked, uh, I did not like it when the youth um, session, when people started saying that young people have to do something, and this and that, we all have to do something. And probably we didn't, instead of saying we have to do something, we have to say I have to, have to do something, and I have to do something. This is what the intellectual elite uh, must do. They have to undertake personal commitments and fulfill them. Thank you so much. Uh, one small observation. Your fifth point is not among the first four. Because in the first four you've, uh, you've discussed some development models, but when you turn to the problems and you move all the previous approaches and pro this is a different approach actually well let me answer you the first four points is uh, theory they will always um, develop strategies but the fifth uh, point i made was uh, not about theory but about practice uh, i would like to pass the floor to mr pankin alexey pankin uh, journalist uh, and political observer. Well, I think that uh, today's Russia is a great example of how uh, stability and development uh, can be combined. For example, if we look at the economy, we have great macroeconomic uh, indicators, a balanced budget, a trade surplus, uh, We have one of the most diversified economies in the world. We make uh, ships, uh, we make aircraft, uh, space industry, nuclear industry. We have the leading positions in IT, at least uh, in a way that we can control our own market and even uh, neighboring countries competing with Google and others. Uh, over the past years, we have been able to carry out major reforms, uh, the reforms of the military and of the police. So this is like a bird eyes view in general strokes. If we look down from the earth, it, everything will be not as uh, simple, but Overall, it, everything is quite positive. We 
agriculture is growing and we're even becoming exporters. This is for development. And uh, Severodvinsk city, which I visited in August 2014, is a case in point. This is a city where Sevmash company is uh, uh, located. This is uh, the maker of uh, submarines. Uh, you see the plant making four or five submarines. You see traffic congestion. You see housing construction and so on. This is for development and now for stability. And all this happening against the backdrop of political stability. The latest presidential election show that people vote as uh, government wants them to vote and people do not feel raped. I do not know people. No one uh, here or anywhere else across Russia in Pskov, uh, Penza, uh, the places that I visited, uh, no one thinks that uh, this choice was imposed on them, although we do know how the, this technology works. Uh, we uh, have uh, law enforcement agencies that are quite smart, who understand that if you don't let occupiers occupy downtown, uh, they can be free to uh, demonstrate on the city outskirts. Uh, only downtown Moscow is uh, a problem. So in uh, the Russian regions, if the government is strong, there will be no problems. There is Facebook, so all the hatred that there is uh, goes into Facebook, so you cannot imagine that even if a part of this goes into the streets, it will be just uh, scary. B but if it's happening on Facebook, well, it's fine. As long as people do not go into the streets with these uh, messages and slogans of hate. And so there is a lot of development against the backdrop of political and economic stability. Why? Uh, Zinoviev had this notion of the success of Stalin's modernization, the great dream, the great propaganda, and the great uh, political police. You take one element and the whole construct goes into pieces. They have to be all three there. Is there anything similar for Russia? Maybe I have not this thought this through, but I did find three things that are also interdependent. The first one is uh, internal, external threat. The country lives in a state of war, and there is aggression against the country, and this is obvious, which creates an incentive to the government uh, to develop itself and to modernize itself and this creates and uh, drives the ideology of patriotism and uh, and this model becomes even attractive across the world. Uh, someone say that we do not have a model to offer to the world. No, we do have a model, the model of uh, promoting conservative values. So. This um, external threat, sanctions, and so on. Uh, the second is what I call a quasi-nationalization of resources and infrastructure, infrastructure industries, the um, sectors without which the country cannot live. I'm speaking about quasi-nationalization because it is not nationalization uh, uh, that is actually happening uh, because this would would have meant uh, mass repression because there are so many people involved so quasi nationalization is about distributing assets among your close uh, circle 
and this creates a development factor our economic development is uh, to a large extent driven by economic laws if I am not mistaken uh, in terms of political economy this is what we see in such situation what are we seeing uh, higher taxes higher retirement age this is not much since what happened in the 1990s given this quasi nationalization is returning in some way to the state so this improves the overall situation for the ordinary people and the third element finally is the great propaganda i think and the great television so when foreigners are saying that we foreigners having all these resources are behind in the informational warfare they're referring only to one thing they are unable to win over russian audiences as they do in foreign countries and this is um, a great achievement that we are able to counter this external threat by our uh, propaganda uh, what are the threats? Uh, the first one is a tactical threat, and it has to do with the fact that this system of development and stability is related to a single person. When one uh, reformer said, how can a bank chairman retire? if all his commitments are like tattoos on his skin a tattooed into his skin so uh, but it's clear that the bank chairman will be replaced sooner or later so in any system of this ki kind of tradition is always very challenging and has many risks and um, Julieta has also mentioned another very important uh, topic of uh, global formatting uh, people are being put in the same digital uh, frame this relates to all countries in uh, people are being formatted across the world this is a threat of scientific and technical pro uh, progress and this is what we're seeing right now so in strategic terms this is the threat uh, that we're facing that we will always remain uh, the same uh, thank you so much i wanted to say regarding our discussion well, we are trying to understand whether stability and, or, and development are compatible or not compatible. We are discussing all this uh, without the notion of development or stability. We just use images. We do not have any precise uh, definitions. Uh, I would like to ask to ask uh, Dmitry Chubarkov, also from Donetsk, uh, you, this is our guest uh, from Donetsk. Uh, So first of all, I would like uh, to say that I'm not an expert, I'm not a sociologist or a political activist, I'm not a journalist per se, I'm just a, a TV presenter on, and I work for a regional broadcaster and uh, the, the fact that I'm regional uh, broadcaster uh, which reflects that we have share a single motherland russia many of those of, to whom i speak in the studio and many of those who live uh, 
who are my neighbors who talk to me to the street, uh, they believe that sooner or later we will become a part of the Russian Federation. We will reunite with Russia. We always remained a part of Russia. We remained with Russia. At the same time, I do understand that history has challenged Donbass, and Donbass accepted the challenge to create its own state. I'm not an expert, but since given the specific nature of my profession and my life, let me share some observations. It can be said that my statement is um, expresses collective sentiment. And I hear this all the time in my work. In Donbass, we live in warlike conditions. This is what makes our state building process so specific. More than 13,000 people died in the process. This is a very heavy price that we have to pay for our statehood. After the crisis of the 2008, the world economy has still not recovered fully. Uh, the post-capitalism and the war uh, came together in Donbass. Uh, what happened in 2014 resulted from various perspectives on the developments. Uh, there is the Russian world and the Russian spring at the same time. Then there is this notion of anti-oligarchic revolution. And starting August 1919, these processes have been prepared. At the t same time, there was a real and an imagined uh, coup that happened. What happened in Donbass was a response to 20 year, to three years of living uh, in uncertain conditions and neglecting common sense. Uh, it was a manifestation of a demand for justice in our region. Uh, Russia had also faced some challenges in 1990s, but there are healthy forces in the political system that were able to respond in Russia, but in Ukraine that uh, had control over Donbass. Uh, there was no one in the elite in the elite to understand these processes. Probably those uh, who developed this concept of Ukraine being separate from Russia has spent all the forces on this intellectual effort and had no nothing left to think about uh, more important things. In terms of uh, space. Donetsk is a territory of war, hybrid warfare and conventional war. We are living in a post-Soviet and a post-capitalist world, and this fully applies to Donbass. And uh, we have to understand uh, an answer to the question that is the topic of this conference. For us, uh, stability and development are also related to a single point. At the same time, the Donetsk Republic has its own uh, specific uh, ca characteristics uh, in terms of decision-making size and uh, the situation that we're living through. We have to respond, respond to what is happening around us. Uh, uh, we have no other choice than to act and to act proactively. There is always a trajectory for any country or entity and a government logic. And the government has to be legitimate. And this legitimacy encompasses not only politics, but also the social sphere and the economy. We need to reason and our conscience to come to terms and to act accordingly. 
We need a research council that would bring together all possible information, analyze it, and generate recommendations, issue recommendations to set milestones and the direction of development. This council has to focus on uh, performance uh, and this is where we need the academic con community. The second uh, aspect of this uh, movement uh, would be to train our conscience, which implies not only stability, but also promoting it in Donbass. We attach great importance to the term popular, which is part people's uh, republic, which is part of the name of our self-proclaimed country. People believe that this does not mean replacing one oligarch to, with uh, 10 smaller oligarchs. This would be too much for the 21st century, even in the state of war. But if there is no other option, The image of a food minister of, uh, being unable to work because of hunger is much better than uh, fed up, uh, fed, well fed uh, officials in a starving country. In Andrei Vesnesensky, a, uh, a poet asked, and why all this? Uh, Nikita Mikhalkov, in one of his interviews, said that regions and uh, Russian provinces have to create an intellectual product that go beyond uh, its uh, significance on the map. And we are aware of the responsibility that we have towards Russia. And we're responsible for the result uh, for the result that of uh, our work. Vladislav Rusanov, an author, said uh, there is a lot of elderly people with gray hair in Donetsk. Thank you so much. Well, I would not uh, have such high hopes for the academic community and, uh, well, Well, let me emphasize that Dmitry came to the same conclusion as uh, Elvira, and that the, there is no alternative to orthodox socialism. So I have a proposal. Let's uh, finish with the presentation, then we may have some time for a discussion left. Uh, Mr. Kulikov, uh, presenter. He is also from Donbass. Uh, by the way, we met with Dmitry in Donetsk, right there. So, for this uh, reason, I'm very glad to see him and thank you for your remarks. Uh, it was very meaningful and emotional. Thank you so much. Uh, I will not give in into this provocation by our moderator who said that we need to have notions. Uh, I think this is a question of suffering. Complaining that we do not have definitions is like saying that we do not I'm very grateful to Mr. Pankin for his presentation I really liked it uh, so if we stop complaining and just look at the how things really are our complaints actually are inconsistent with the reality in fact uh, and but still we continue to complain uh, to complain that we do not have uh, an ideology w uh, just imagine we have been living without ideology for 30 years now 
there are politicians, philosophers, demagogues, quasi-philosophers, and say that that this is so bad. So why are you laughing? You are not afraid. Well, you cannot live without ideology. We have been living without ideology for 30 years. So we lived uh, this way for 30 years, and on the 31st year, it is not not okay. So unless we begin to change everything, we will maybe survive for another day. We, so we need ideology. We do need definitions. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. How all these concepts work? This has to do with stability and development. But I would uh, discuss the soundness of the mind in this respect, because I think it is an important subject. And by the way, it was Dmitry who forced me to change uh, the substance of my presentation. What else uh, uh, horrible was said? Everyone has bank accounts abroad. Our elite, so we have no future if uh, everyone in the elite have bank accounts abroad. Well, I, um, I do have an account. Just think about it. What are we accepting? We have been told that Russia has no future without Ukraine. And Bzezinski also uh, told us that uh, you have to give up right away uh, because we control your elite. And this was not Baburin who said it. It was uh, uh, Bzezinski. So uh, uh, the Ru Russia, Soviet Union, uh, no need to worry because everything is already said. All you can do is wake up. We control your elite. They have children and they have bank accounts over there. And uh, a question, the people who have children abroad and uh, bank accounts abroad, are they Russian pe people? Not in terms of their ethnic background, but in terms of uh, the uh, belonging to Russia, people who have bank accounts, uh, will they betray the uh, fatherland just because they have a foreign bank account? Uh, just think, why do I have this idea? I understood this when I debated with Ukrainian guests in my shows. They said that, just look, there is uh, the Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine. It's so corrupt. Uh, all the bishops and the Moscow Patriarchate, they will give up to the Ukrainian Patriarch. But how can you say this? I tell them. Where did you get this? And it's so convincing. I'm looking at the audience. People are listening. All the bishops uh, are expected to go to Filaret, the Ukrainian patriarch, which is not the case, of course. Do you understand or you do not understand how it relates with stability and development? When Elvira uh, set up this intellectual provocation of this kind, I was uh, uh, quietly laughing. These are not four strategies she was, she was talking about. This is just nonsense. Um, but what she said is that our elite, including the academic elite or non-academic elite, clubs, culture, uh, literature, philosophical elite, uh, they are discussing the four possible strategies and they sp spend hours and hours and a lot of energy discussing and debating about the four possible strategies. Everyone is busy but nothing is being done, actually. 
regarding stability and development what we need is to look closely at our history there is everything we need in terms of um, knowledge that we may need we have to know and understand our history I will support Alexei in this regard I one said that the pension reform is a small price that we pay uh, for the regime that we're building in Russia. And let me remind you about how stability is linked to development. In 1960s, Kasigin uh, made all the necessary calculations, and it was clear that uh, 70% of people from collective farms had to be sent to major construction sites across the Soviet Union. The same was for the intellectual class. There was debate how many intellectuals had to be sent as construction workers, 99% um, or 100%. Uh, there was no sense uh, behind the Stalin's repressions. It was about removing uh, fixtures labor, improving effectiveness and efficiency. And it was obvious. And several things had to be done alongside this. Improve uh, prices, open up uh, trade, and maybe something else. And it is said when the political bureau came together, Brezhnev said that our people had to suffer so much in recent years that the Communist Party cannot do this. Uh, the Communist Party could tell people that the communism would be built by 1980, but uh, do, to do something uh, in order to avoid a perestroika and to avoid uh, what uh, uh, China had to go through, there was no one to do that. But China, they had only several thousand people of victims, but they were able to ensure stability. So I refused to speak about definitions for a purpose because this would divert our attention from the essence of the question. It is not a coincidence that we're talking about China here. We can ask China whether the country had to pay a big price or the price was not that big. Probably it would be not smart to argue about this. We, by the same token, we can ask Donbass whether 13,000 people is a lot or not as in terms of victims uh, and sacrifice. Uh, stable, stability, and development uh, cannot be taken out of the historical contest. People in Donbass is more than 2 million people. So this is quite a few people. This is comparable to the Baltic Tigers, if you may. We have to understand that both stability and development take play, result from historical choices. And in this respect, people in Donbass made a choice clear and confirm them and no one uh, Russia or let alone the West uh, will not deprive Donbass of its choice and Ukraine has long uh, made a choice this is what Todor Todorov uh, said the future where is the future uh, future is not what we are in uh, today but in the past uh, what we have in the past is uh, holds everything that will be in the future. What happened in Ukraine shows us what uh, the future holds for this uh, territory. Of course, we do understand that there are some processes that are not completely clear, but in 
Ukraine no longer exists as, as a post-Soviet republic. Um, there will be no uh, uh, remake of the Soviet Union. Uh, will we go back to the Russian Empire? When we uh, give up on one project model, we move to another one. Well, of course, uh, this would change the geography of our country, including for Donbass. Uh, the territory of the Donetsk region, the Donetsk People Republic, uh, is a uh, part of Ukraine, but it used uh, to be a territory of the Donbas army. So thank you so much. This is what I had to say. Hold on, hold on. Well, you did uh, contradict me, but you did introduce a definition. So you defined stability by the fact that if you have a clear understanding of something, if you understand how you will act and you take a decision, you are stable. So regarding Donbas, despite the political crisis, there is stability in Donbas if we use your definition because people have made the right choice. While development, uh, as you described it, is more of a historical notion that is take, takes place in a historical contest. So there is this uh, change that uh, has certain mechanisms behind it. So, well, I have to add two things. I cannot fail. You just reminded me. When I said uh, about uh, bank accounts and that we do not have to judge these people, let's remember the Soviet times, all the people were mostly poor, only top officials uh, had this rich lifestyle. These people wanted uh, jeans, blue jeans, beer, and video recorders. Well, I mean, not maybe not all, but many did want, and a substantial part of the elite wanted this. They did not have accounts anywhere. So I'm not trying to accuse anyone. I'm trying to oppose any blame or simple uh, explanations in this situation. What uh, makes a Russian person different? A Russian person who is going uh, to war already buries himself. When they sign up as volunteer or go uh, to the recruitment office, uh, this is like uh, a burial ceremony. People are free after that. And I understood this in Donbass when I went there. I knew about this before, but uh, there I had this uh, the full understanding of how people live there for five years now. So uh, stability is about uh, taking the decision. So if the decision is there, if you are living forward, then According to opinion polls, so these are statistics, so this is not an opinion. 21% of the population, every fifth person is, uh, can justify a betrayal of uh, motherland. This is among young people. Mr. Sergeyev. Uh,
So what are we actually discussing? We're discussing notions. I will allow myself to some would have some follow up comments, uh, and and I had something to say about development. Uh, One of Zinoviev's uh, students uh, uh, called me, it was back in 1984. And I had to make a presentation there. And he told me that uh, Toynbee wrote that any nation that is not looking into the future at any given moment uh, is doomed to be buried in the tomb of the past. Uh, well, of course I agree with Toynbee, I said. Okay, then I ask you a second question. And you? What would you do? And I had to say that uh, I would be active every second in thinking about the future. So this is what development is all about. Just let me tell you that this uh, implies certain consequences. Those who do not want to work for their future want to have some calm and which I would not would not call stability. This has nothing to do with stability. I think that this is a very interesting situation. They either have uh, to be subjected by development groups, uh, not in cultural but in social terms. Cultural uh, development is voluntary. You can either go forward or stay at the same place. It is a personal choice. I did not want to stay in the tomb of the past, as in the Toynbee quote. This is just about making a choice, whether you want to promote development or not. But this is in cultural terms, but in social terms, this is a compulsory process. But you have to have at least some critical thinking for that. You can think about it in any terms, in political, in ethical terms, but if you don't want to become a thing of the past, And this is not a good thing to be, to stay in the past. And I decided that I made the right choice of say, by saying that I do not want to stay in the past. They will have to be forced to move forward, those who do not realize the importance. And this is the foundation of social engineering. It is a band um, as relating to fascism, but everyone does it and uh, try to engineer social change, to force people to move in some direction. If we look at Russia um, in uh, 1868 uh, until 1918, 50 years. So there was this uh, liberation of uh, peasants, uh, and uh, there was these great reforms. People wanted land. It was obvious that there was no land available for peasants. Uh, it was obvious even before that. It was obvious to all the commissions that work on the agrarian reform and on the land question, but no one really cared much. And there was even this um, political expression uh, for this, and uh, the Duma, even before the Bolsheviks, uh, already had all the answers to this question. Of course, in any social system, there are people who do not belong, the people uh, 
who uh, are supposed to develop themselves but are not aware uh, and cannot say whether they want to or not. And they have to understand this. And there is always this situation. It uh, just uh, uh, context may change, but the, situa the situation, the problem remains the same. Uh, it, uh, you cannot discuss the, the question of the cost because you always have to pay it. You do have to pay it. We do not know whether 13,000 lives lost in Donbass, whether it is the price or there will be more victims. So it makes no sense uh, to discuss that they will have to pay the price. And the peasants in uh, 1868, they had to pay the price. They did not share any single ideology or they were inadequate in terms of the new economy, in terms of new requirements of agriculture. and. Uh, they uh, did not know, they, they did not want to develop now, and they became a thing of the past. No matter how you look at it in ethical terms, uh, we will have uh, to promote development. And uh, yes, uh, Soviet people, they've become literate, they've started working in the industry, they not just become literate in terms of language and math, but also they acquired professional skills and but another things the different things happened uh, and it was also obvious ortega and gasset uh, uh, wrote about the insurrections of the masses and he wrote that all the institutions created by our civilization work for uh, an average person for mediocrity So the masses will come to power sooner or later, and this philosopher wrote about this. And this is what actually happened. The mediocrity came to power, and we now know what this is. And when they come to power, to power they wanted to be supported and financed. And this type of power, they wanted to be financial, supported financially, and how long could this last? Uh, if you have a competitor working in a different social setting, we will n never fail to admit the question of uh, development. I will not elaborate on the social engineering concept, but there is n no getting away from this. So there is another situation in today's world. Uh, development programs. Uh, yes, Kulik, Mr. Kulikov mentioned about, uh, mentioned history, but in terms of experience, you cannot predict it. There is no stability since you cannot predict the future, but we can decide what to do. There are some that can develop. The United States cannot develop in the sense that I've discussed, just that the Soviet Union was unable to develop itself at a certain point, or Russia before it was unable to develop itself. Uh, there is a new way we need to launch degradation and destruction for your opponents. Your opponents have to move in a different direction, in the opposite direction, and this is quite possible. And to the extent that stability as a term can be used in Brezhnev times, and not regarding Brezhnev times, but regarding Putin's times, it was the fact that we understood that there are efforts uh, to degrade our countries, and we had to prevent them from harming our country. We understand that this is being done. So this is where we are, where we stand. Stability is just another name for the state, for political unity and solidarity of all the governance mechanisms. 
So I will not introduce any new terms to this. I will use an existing terminology. You cannot uh, uh, put it in simpler terms. All decision makers and all their activities have uh, to have some kind of political solidarity. This is what the state is all about. If you don't have a state, you don't have stability, you won't have development, only a tomb of the past. Even not even this, because no one will write who is in this uh, tomb. Now about labor. This is a very serious matter. But I wanted to say that this question was resolved even before the war. The first constitution said that political rights will belong only to the working people. Those who do not work will not have labor rights. This is a reasonable way to frame this uh, labor on law. And it was interesting to find out how can we rely on labor, and it so happened. And this has to be f requires further analyze that by 1936, this disappeared from the Stalin Constitution. Political f rights were transferred to the people, to, to everyone. And not everyone uh, works, not everyone is in labor. And not everyone has to be in labor. In terms of uh, politics, we gave up on labor. And it happened not in 1990s, not in 1960s, but in 1936. Well, let's open the 30, 1936 Constitution. Everyone has political rights, not only the workers. I'm not speaking. Uh, uh, about the rights to labor. I'm uh, speaking the rights of labor. And in the Italian uh, constitution, there is this notion that the Italian uh, republic is based on labor. And we no longer had it started in 1936. In 1918, this uh, was one case. In 1936, it was a different story. So it, it all happened before the Second World War. So if you are discussing seriously the political status of labor, let's look at the pre-war period. What happened? There are some um, problems there as well. At the time, why are you talking about the politics? If there is no political rights for labor, why do we discuss it? Be since without this, in your social system, you cannot talk about labor ethics, about education. If there is no political uh, framework, uh, no political right, you cannot speak about this. So this is a question of why, and I'm not going to answer this. Just compare the two constitutions. So this is what I wanted to say about labor. So one or two mi minutes, no. Uh, I will end at that. So this is a very important uh, point I wanted to make. We have a separate conversation going on in one of the corners. Uh, so I would like to describe this situation. We had uh, witnessed here one of the drummers uh, uh, the, which explains why the Soviet uh, project came to pieces. And I'm very serious. Just look at this. 
when after a, I get political rights for uh, my labor when I vote and I so I get this right to appoint the government and until 1936 only those who worked uh, had the right to, to vote uh, who had this responsibility and uh, once the political right to shape government uh, is n does not come with any responsibilities. This is what Madame Balandina said about the sense of duty. No one has any duties here. There is no duty for any of us in principle. And uh, you just enjoy political rights and uh, with the taxes as a cover. I have only one responsibility to pay taxes. Well, do you pay taxes? Well, even formally, if you look at the American reality, if you do not pay uh, $100 in taxes, you get a 10-year prison term. And a lot of people are on welfare, but they still enjoy the same political rights. And you want this world to live. No, I'm just stopping this conversation. Over there, the government taxes the government. They just have this fictitious model of social organization. Of course, this is, has nothing to do with the work. Uh, an answer to the question of what kind of a government can we build when we have both rights and the responsibilities, duty against privilege. This is for an aristocratic society. And when we have new social uh, groups, privileges against uh, duties. Yes, is this it? Uh, so I'm uh, both delighted and horrified by what is going on here because on the one hand I was uh, comforted uh, by Mr. Pumpkin who said that the opposition is on the outskirts and the economy is developing steadily. So. This was very comforting, uh, and Dmitry said that those who have bank accounts abroad have a lot of great people among them who are not going to betray their country. I was um, alarmed by the what Alexei said, and not even on labor about underappreciating the question of the land in Russia compared to this question even the uh, destruction of the Russian communities by Stolypin is almost like a romantic story because in fact in the constitution of 1918 there was this obligation to work for everyone so everyone was at work and uh, five categories were limited in their constitutional rights. We do not have to have any confusion. In 1936, regarding political rights, rights yes, there was what you talked about. It did not change the thing with the cult of labor. And this uh, value uh, remained in place, labor as a value. And it was only destroyed by the neoliberals in the 1990s uh, today. Yes, uh, the government brings up a lot of uh, people who do nothing, but they have to pay taxes. So, yes, we have this idea today that even self-employed have to pay taxes. So if 
we go back to this uh, choice, uh, we have to have a socially mindful choice. Uh, the Convention of People's Deputies uh, was for a Chinese model, but a different uh, trend was at the top. And Gaidar economics are still alive, and we still still see these outcomes. We still do not understand agriculture. No farming is possible in our country because we have a different climate and many other distinctive features. And we do not understand the value of uh, organized labor People's um, collective enterprises have to be the foundation of the economy. It, uh, they existed uh, in the Russian Empire before the revolution. They uh, suffered in the Soviet time and they uh, disappeared in uh, Russia. We have uh, different opinions and it is great that we are able to discuss uh, all these matters. I would like to ask Mironova to sum up our conversation. I would like to thank uh, everyone who took part in Zinovia Freedings. Uh, everything was very well organized and uh, special thanks to Ksenia Zinovia, our art director of our club. She did a great deal. She prepared all the leaflets and logistics, took care of the logistics for all our participants. Thank you to her and thank uh, to all of you and see you next time.